Here in Calais, you'd think we're a long way from the battlefields of the First World War. But this monument to the Dover Patrol that kept U-boats out of the channel throughout the conflict reminds us that we're not. There was another war out there. In terms of surface combatants, there was only ever one really major battle, the inconclusive clash called the Battle of Jutland in mid-1916, the only time the mighty dreadnoughts ever met. It's interesting, they said of the head of the British Navy that he was the only man who could lose the war in an afternoon. That afternoon never came. Der Tag never came. The German high seas fleet limped home and it never ventured forth again. But the U-boats did. And the Dover Patrol kept them out of the channel with strenuous effort, including a net stretching from England to France. But U-boats were throughout the North Atlantic trying to strangle Britain, posing a geopolitical threat that eventually brought the United States into the war. And the victory of the anti-submarine warriors was of enormous importance. The Germans certainly understood that after they conquered France in World War II. The Nazis blew it up. Of course, it was rebuilt to stand here and remind us of the battles that took place under the waves and on them, as well as in the mud. Ah, uh, home sweet trench. What could possibly convince a man to leave these comforts, to get up into no man's land, get hung up on barbed wire, and be disemboweled by a machine gun? Unless, of course, he was ordered to do it by a witless and heartless general. But that is a complete misunderstanding of the nature of the war. In the First World War, something like 60% of all the casualties were caused by artillery fire. The reason generals kept ordering men to attack is that to leave them where they were was to sentence them to certain death. I mean, yeah, going over the top was not an attractive alternative, but under the circumstances, it wasn't an irrational thing to do or to order men to do. Even the noise of a simulated bombardment here at the Musée Somme 1916 in Albert, France, is almost unendurable. And I know I'm not about to be blown to bits. Eugene Sledge, in his memoir of fighting with the Marines in World War II in the Pacific, said shelling was a nightmare like no other. When it started, time stopped. You never knew if it had been five minutes or two hours. And one of the things that's generally not appreciated about World War I, the reason why men were willing to jump out of trenches and charge machine guns, other than because some nit with a revolver and permission to shoot them if they didn't go, had ordered them to, is that it was the artillery that did the bulk of the killing on both sides. In a way, it's an immensely impressive logistical achievement. The Allies and the Central Powers pouring the industrial prowess and inventiveness of the late 19th century into the task of killing men on an unprecedented scale, firing millions and millions of shells, day after day, week after week, month after month. In a ghastly way, it's an impressive achievement. One of the most harrowing aspects of World War I, underlined by this exhibit on battlefield medicine here at the Inflanders Fields Museum in Ypres, is trying to provide medical care under the conditions of trench warfare. The dirt, the danger, and the lack of adequate surgical and other techniques. There were no antibiotics. Those came along in time for the Second World War, but terrible infections, men dying of gangrene, all sorts of horrors here. In the First World War, when you think about it from a technological point of view, it seems to me it's a period when people apply techniques they already had, refine them, develop, for instance, effective combat aircraft. They don't really invent a lot of things, though there are a few, and they show mankind at its worst and at its best. The First World War saw the first blood bank and also the first flamethrower. It saw the vacuum tube developed and poison gas. And also, here's an odd one, the tampon. So many men were wounded in the war that there was an urgent need for bandaging material. This led to the development of cellulose cotton, basically cotton wadding made from trees rather than from cotton plants, produced in enormous quantities. And as French nurses handled the stuff, they realized that this extraordinarily absorbent soft material had another promising use as well. It was picked up by British and American and Canadian nurses. And after the war, commercially, tampons started to be manufactured, though it was some years before anybody was willing to advertise and they seemed a little bit distasteful, though compared to World War I, I'm not sure what could seem distasteful. At any rate, by 1926, Montgomery Ward was advertising them. And there are other technological advances, too. I mean, the tank makes its first appearance in World War I. You see in the early films, these things are clumsy. They're beasts. They get stuck in trenches. They seem almost a feeble parody of a war fighting machine. But you look at the tanks of mid-1918, they're a lot different than the ones that foundered at Cambrai and elsewhere. In these small ways, 
human beings made significant advances in the most horrible things they could do to one another and in the things that could make life genuinely better.